Alrighty. Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to our webinar today. Uh, I think the title was Distributed SQL, a Modern Cloud Native Postgres SQL. So it's, uh, you know, I guess it's kind of telling what we're going to do. Um, you know, when I think about what we're going to talk about today, I mean, I'm going to talk to you guys about Cockroach DB for sure. And, and you know, how do we actually gain a, da a database that's we like to think of as indestructible. We think of as scalable and easy to scale, um, yet still delivering on the promise of SQL, right? How can you actually use a database that looks and feels like Postgres, but takes advantage of cloud and allows you to have elastic scale, allows you to be resilient, um, allows you to do some really cool things. We're gonna do a little bit of a mix between, um, you know, just a couple slides to just set up, uh, you know, context, but then um, I am joined by my friend Chris, who's actually going to do some demos as well. But before we get started, before we introduce ourselves, I just want a bit of, bit of housekeeping. There is a QA panel. Um, please do feel free to enter your questions there. That'd be great. Um, you know, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be monitoring that along the way um, to, to, to pick those off and, you know, lob the questions into, into Chris. Uh, you know, he's the technologist, so, you know, I like to show his, his knowledge off. Um, and so, and we'll, we'll, we'll blick them off as we can. Um, there's also a chat, you know, please feel free to use the chat as a, as an alternate method. I think there's a couple of, uh, members of our team that are, that are on the chat who might answer you before we even get to it. Um, they've been known to do that. I've got a couple of, I think I see a couple of the names on there that'll do that. So please feel free to use either the chat or the QA. Um, at the end of the, at the end of the webinar, there'll be a survey. Please do leave us feedback. We take that stuff to heart. We, measure ourselves on the success and, and applicability of each one of these webinars. Uh, and then of course, a recording will definitely be available. Uh, JP, who is on the call with us as well, will definitely send that out to everybody. But before I get started, thank you for joining us. So that, Chris Cassano, thanks for joining us today. Can you give us a little quick intro of uh, who you are, what your role is, and what you do here at uh, Cockroach Labs, Chris? Sure, hey everyone, great to meet you. So Chris Cassano. I'm a solution engineer here at Cockroach Labs. I've been here for about just under a year. I've been working with database technologies for the past 20 years or so. Uh, my job is to help listen to customers to figure out what you need, um, what you might need to migrate, what you might need to build, and help you along the way. So I sit you know, with our field team, I sit with our engineering team, our product team to help make sure that your success is, uh, you know, um, is fulfilled. Yep. And, and, you know, any and all questions today for either Chris or I are welcome, y'all. Uh, and so you do have a little bit of a deeper technical hands-on keyboard. Um, I can get into the theory behind the database uh, and, and kind of how people are using it as well. Um, but my name is Jim Walker. I'm, uh, I'm in product marketing here at Cockroach Labs. I, too, have been in data for 20, I don't know, 20 something years, Chris. I don't want to like, I'm not one-upping you. It's actually not a, not a something you want to one-up somebody on. Um, uh, but I, yeah, I've been in data for really quite some time and, and kind of the trajectory of, you know, service oriented architectures, you know, I was an early user of BEA tuxedo and everybody doesn't know what that is. That was, you know, BEA web logic, you know, it was kind of the, the precursor to this entire microservices movement, I feel. Uh, and so here we are mixing that world with the whole world of developers and data. And so um, I, I love this topic and I, I think my, I hope my emotion will come out uh, in, in what we're about to present here today. But again, please do ask questions. I, I will start, you know, some people have given us feedback over the past couple of webinars, you know. Uh, you know, I, it would have been nice to know if this is an entry level or more advanced. I think when we talk about Kubernetes, especially, some people are really, really super advanced on that side, you know, and, and we have some some content that's even more high level. Um, this is definitely an intro to, to Cockroach DB. This is, you know, we're gonna we're gonna definitely get into the weeds and show you the product as well. But this is a, definitely a good high level intro into what we do and 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 who's using it and how they're using it. Uh, and, and with some, with a healthy dose of how do we scale clusters? How do we actually survive things? Uh, how do we integrate with, with, with other systems? How do you, I think Chris is going to do a, a, a demo on rolling upgrades too, which is really cool um, and kind of a, a unique, unique thing here. So we'll do a little bit of a hands-on keyboard time and, and a little bit of slides as well. So, um, so, you know, we start this conversation a lot with organizations and, you know, ultimately, you know, the people that I know and, and the organizations that we talk to and probably everybody here on this call is somewhere along this curve in terms of scale and complexity. And, and I think it's, it's kind of not a, a like, should we move to the cloud? I think most organizations, the, the large majority, the 99% are kind of moving and shifting 
uh, workloads to the cloud. You know, nobody's really running on-prem data centers as much anymore. And even if they are doing things on-prem as a data center, they're actually treating that thing as a cloud and, and trying to deploy everything as a service. You know, and, and the cloud has really had a, a, a very fundamental impact on the way that we think about systems uh, and the way that we think about the way that we design applications. Our, our application architectures have been starting to change because of this, right? Like the, the advent of microservices and, and how do we gain efficiencies from compute, right? Uh, so we can actually minimize cost by breaking down our applications into these, you know, this big monolithic into these, these microservices so we can scale each one of them individually and take advantage of that sort of stuff, right? And so, you know, with this, this advance, um, you know, sometimes I think we solve things, but but introduce bigger problems, uh, and 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 somehow magically with the cloud, we've actually introduced some some challenges as well. And and I think the complexity of the cloud, uh, the complexity of taking advantage of you know true elastic compute and 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 having these systems, while we we we've, we've kind of you, you like lessened our risk and and our spend from you know our capital expenditure side of the world into operating expenses. Um, you know, we are still kind of struggling to, to meet the needs of users as they're all across the planet, you know. Um, some of the things that we run into with organizations and some of the complexities and the challenges they have is, you know, what about transactions in, 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 in distributed applications, you know, as we scale these things up and down, as you go through microservices, how do we ensure that data is correct in the database? Um, how do we make sure that, you know, as we start to, to, to deploy services in multiple different parts of the planet and different data centers, that they aren't conflicting with each other. These things are all really, really big challenges. Um, however, a lot of the large organizations, you know, some of the stuff, some of the logos you see here, like the Netflixes of the world, you know, the Facebooks, the you know, Google, AWS, Google, Google for sure. Uh, you know, they've been dealing with these things. And 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 lucky for a lot of us is a lot of these leading organizations, in particular Google, in many ways, and some of the things that they've that they've put out. Um, you know, they, they, they do have this kind of open source exhaust is what I like to call it. Like they, you know, how do we all get Google infrastructure for everybody? And so Google has been pretty good about, you know, pushing off things like Kubernetes so we can all run our systems like the board, which is their backend, right? Like, like the stuff they do around TensorFlow, like putting, you know, and, and, and notably for us, it's the, the white paper they wrote around Google Spanner, which is a, was a distributed database they needed for transactions to run their internal workloads. And for us, you know, using some of the concepts that were found in that paper, but making it open for anybody to use it across any cloud and to actually truly implement a, a distributed relational database in the cloud and take advantage of this cloud infrastructure. That's why Cockroach Labs exist. We actually want to help people move up this curve and reduce some of this operational complexity that they find when they actually land in the cloud, all right? And so that's really our mission is to make data easy. Um, you know, when I first joined, I was like, that's kind of, uh, that's tough, man. And data is data's always gonna be a little bit difficult. Making data easy and, and you know, around certain things that we just don't wanna deal with around scale and resilience and, and where it lives and, and, and making it available and, and dealing with these, the speed of light. Cause ultimately I think that's our challenge when it comes to distributed systems, right? And so. You know, ultimately, we, we, we always get asked, why another database? We have relational databases. I've been using Oracle for, I don't know how many, dozens, dozens of years, right? Like, Postgres is awesome. Uh, it's a great relational. MySQL is, is phenomenal, right? These, there's even open source versions of these things. There's a lot of NoSQL databases, the Cassandras of the world. They're phenomenal. Um, you know, Mongo is a very widely used and developer-friendly database. Um, but they've been used for certain purposes. And, and I think the relational databases in particular were architected in a different era. They weren't architected for this modern computer. I'm gonna come back to that on the next slide. The NoSQL databases on the other hand, well, they were optimized for heavy read access and or for documents and distribution of this sort of like these document databases. They took off the, the, the guide rails around transactions and consistency of data um, to air for kind of, you know, fast access and read of massive, huge amounts of data. You know, there's a new era of database um, and there is a new advent of something that's different that does take advantage of, you know, cloud scale and, and these elastic architectures yet still can apply these relational concepts to it. And that is, is distributed SQL. Uh, and that is exactly where, where, where Cockroach fits in. So, you know, why use you know, an existing database in the cloud. You know, it's funny, like I think everybody wants to be a cloud database these days. You know, I think 
you know, Gartner is a major analyst firm. They think every database is going to be a cloud database eventually. And, and, and I agree with them. Um, you know, if I think if we fast forward three to four years, what does, you know, a database mean and what does it look like in the cloud? And I think I always think of like three types of cloud database. Number one, there's a legacy database in the cloud. You're taking something like Postgres or Oracle or, or SQL Server and you're just running it in cloud infrastructure. That, that's one type, right? And then there's these kind of legacy augmented database, like Aurora is like that. Aurora isn't truly, a, I mean, it's running in cloud, sure, it's, it's offered by AWS, but is it taking advantage of distributed compute? No, it's, it's basically just a bunch of instances of Postgres or MySQL or what, what have you running on top of distributed storage and they're sharing data underneath. It's not really a shared nothing architecture, like a true cloud native system, right? Like where, where it's designed for scale, it's designed for resilience at the core of what it does. And that's where I think there's, there's several databases that are emerging over, over the past couple of years of which, you know, we're absolutely one of them where we're rewriting the database from the ground up um, to take advantage of these things, right? To, to rework the, you know, that execution layer, to rework the way we think about storing data so we can do some really cool things uh, within the database. And, you know, ultimately underneath Cockroach, the way that we store, we're, we're actually a database on top of a database that incorporates an entire database. It, it sounds very meta, but, you know, we're a cloud native distributed SQL database that acts like a relational database that actually lives on top of a KV store, right? There's different layers and there's ways that we've architected things so that we can actually give you all some pretty advanced capabilities, but but have it look just like Postgres. Like just still use SQL and be that database that you would expect um, as you write queries. And so, you know, when we talk about Cockroach, you know, we start with this is standard developer-friendly SQL. We haven't created some new dialect. Um, you know, we're gonna allow you to treat this as as you would any relational database. There's a couple things we don't do. Uh, two of them in particular, which I think we get questions about a lot, uh, stored procedures and triggers. And, I, and if you look at both of those technologies and the emergence of stored procedures over the last 15, 20 years, I mean, she's, I was doing these things a long time ago. You know, we built stored procedures because we didn't have like a central place to run a service. It's kind of like a service, right? We did things to optimize things in the database, but but they weren't kind of part of the overall kind of application code base, right? And so, you know, we're seeing this migration of, of people who, who were taking things that might have been a stored procedure in the past and just actually implementing it as a Lambda function or, or as, a, as a microservice or as part of the larger, larger architecture. And so, you know, for us, do you actually want to be doing stored procedures in the database itself, you know, or should that be abstracted up? And, and it's our it's our belief that you know, those things should be part of the application architecture ultimately. So that actually enjoys the testing and, and, and the management and everything else. And so that's kind of one of those things, regardless, you're doing joins, you expect isolation, you know, and guarantees and transactions. You don't want casually consistent. I, I think like the, I, I think like a primitive of a database is it shouldn't lose data. Um, and so, but, but also, you know, we've gone to great lengths to actually guarantee uh, transactional consistency to the serializable isolation level, if you're familiar with those sort of things. Um, but we also want to build for scale and a, and a true cloud native system builds scale in it inherently. Um, you know, the Kubernetes is built for scale, right? And so this is kind of the same world in terms of what cloud native is, but, but also building in resilience because when the entire stack is, is, is survivable, um, you end up with this kind of indestructible uh, database. It's always on, always available. It's really difficult to, to scale Cockroach and hence our, our name. Um, but I think this last one is actually pretty important. Uh, you know, delivering local latencies at global scale. You know, and if I think about distributed SQL, and I think about any sort of distributed system, either in a single data center or, or even globally distributed in multiple different data centers, um, if you're going to be a distributed database, you, you need to be able to tie data to a location because ultimately your, 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 your ultimate competitor is the speed of light. I can't beat the speed of light. Like photons only travel so fast, I have fiber, whatever. Like, and so having data live near users, being able to tie data to a particular location, while really great for like compliancy and privacy and all these things, it's it ultimate like, wow, that's what a, what a great use case for, for Cockroach. Ultimately we do it because of performance. Um, and, and there's technologies that we've implemented within Cockroach around wrapped and MVCC that allow us to do some really cool things, 
but it's really about, you know, how do we make sure that this database is going to be great enough so that you get a single data center or a single cent single instance kind of experience, but at a distributed global scale, if that's what you need. Uh, and so those are the, some of the things that we're doing in the database itself. Um, this is a unique architecture. This is a clustered environment. Uh, you spin up a node, you point it at the cluster, and the cluster is just going to take care of this coordination and consensus, like how, how do transactions happen? You know, if a transaction comes in in New York and a transaction comes in at Sydney at the, at the same time on the same account, same, you know, say it's a financial services thing, who wins, right? The database is actually going to take care of that contention. Um, and it's going to coordinate all of that uh, in a global or in a single data center as well. It's going to take care of, 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 of replicating data, repairing data, rebalancing. If you want to scale, there's no more manual sharding. I don't have to think about the data itself. The database just takes care of that. I simply spin up a node, point it at the cluster, and the cluster is going to rebalance data. Chris is going to show us kind of how this works. And I, I'm not going to talk too long. I, I've already talked long enough. Um, but if you lose a node, right, do you need active passive systems and have to deal with like redoing database? Like we're going to show you that too. Like how do you have an always on, always available, indestructible database? Every single node in Cockroach is a gateway to the rest of the database. So we're talking about truly a single database that's spanning multiple data centers. It could be spanning multiple clouds if you want. Uh, I could spin up a node right here on this, on this laptop, um, point it at a cluster, and it could take, it's an endpoint. It can find data that's in this kind of virtual, uh, you know, logical database it, that's physically living in lots of different places. So that's ultimately kind of like our architecture in, in, in a nutshell. But I want to get into Chris and, and allow Chris to show you some of these things. So. Take it away, buddy. Sure, let me just share my screen and let me know if you can see my screen. Uh, let me stop, oh, you, you yeah, let me stop sharing. There we go, bud. And then um, again, everybody, if you have any questions or you need to direct Chris into an area, please do, but we can see your, we can see your screen, Chris, so thank you. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna show a resilience demo today. I'll give you an idea of how, um, how we can spin up a cluster. Um, I'm going to spin up a, a six node cluster and then I'm going to take you through failure scenarios. So what happens if a node fails? What happens if multiple nodes fail? How do you survive through these things? The way Cockroach is designed is that based on how you want to uh, run um, in across, like Jim mentioned, across multiple regions or in a single region, we can architect you for the right survive survivability. So um, let's just uh, spin up the demo. And uh, I'm going to bring up a cluster real quick. Like I said, it's going to be a six node cluster. Okay, here we go. This is the admin UI if you haven't seen Cockroach before. Um, so you can see we have six nodes here. Each of the nodes are listed below, you know, N1 through N6. Um, and I'm also firing up a workload as well. And if you wanted to see what's actually happening on the database, you can come over to the metric side on the navigation on the left hand side. In just a moment, you're going to start seeing some, you know, some queries taking off. And uh, actually, before I even show you the metrics, I'll show you what I, I set up. We set up a, um, a database here called YCSB. Uh, if you're familiar with some of the benchmarks that are out there, YCSB is a Yahoo benchmark. Um, and that's what we're running right now in the database. So if we go back to the metrics, you'll see that we actually have um, some load happening here. Nothing crazy. We have about 50 queries or so of 50 transactions per second. Um, you know, and then showing you selects, updates, uh, inserts, deletes. So what we want to show is what happens if the node goes down? Um, what is the database going to do? Is Cockroach going to be able to survive that? And it absolutely is going to be able to survive that. So what I'm going to do is just going to click enter. And it's actually going to bring down one of the nodes, my, my script is. So in just a moment here, you're going to see that one of the nodes are actually going to go down. We're not going to have six live nodes. We'll have um, one that's suspect. There we go. We have a suspect node. And let's check to see what's going on with our workload. Our workload is still going. Um, you'll see that the database still continues to live on. Now, one thing about um, you know, distributed SQL and with Cockroach is that we uh, replicate the data across all these different nodes. And by default, we replicate the, uh, the data three times. If you wanted to see that, you can actually come into the database. And I'm going to go into an advanced debug section. And here's my user table in YCSB. And you can see that we have three replicas uh, within you know, node four, five, and six. Okay? And right now, our default replication is three. 
what I can always do is I can increase my replication factor. And what does that give me? That gives me better survivability. So as more simultaneous failures happen, I can survive through them. I can survive through even an entire regional failure if I architect my, um, my setup correctly. Uh, to do that, you know, I, would, I could spin up three regions with a replication factor of three. And if an entire region goes down, I can have two surviving regions and my data can live on. Um, in a scenario like this, where I have a six, uh, a six node cluster, and I have a default replication factor of three, I can really only survive through one node right now, one node failure. But if I want to increase that, I can increase the replication factor to five, and then I can survive through two node failures. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to actually um, bring this node back, right? I'll bring this node back so you can see that we'll have um, you know, six live nodes. All right, so yeah, we can see we have six live, live nodes, and uh, the database is doing um, a few things to make sure that is balanced and replicated. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change the replication factor on the fly. So this is a live database. I'm going to increase the replication factor to five. And in the background, it's going to start, you know, the, the shards that it creates within the database, it's going to start replicating, replicating them more. So in just a few moments, oh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead too quick. You can see that my admin UI is showing that I am under replicated right now, right? Because I increased the five. So now it has to take those shards and distribute them and balance them across the cluster. So it's going to do that in the background. And then I can go back to my uh, distribution page that I was showing you before. And you'll eventually see that this will, you know, show that the replication factor for the user table is spread to five. There you go. You can see that we're, uh, we're across five different nodes now. Um, because I can do this, now I can survive through two node failures. So let's go back to our admin page. Everything looks good and healthy. We have six live nodes. All of our ranges are replicated. We have nothing under replicated. And now I'm actually going to kill two nodes. So there's the first one going down and the second one going down. So the same thing. You're going to see two suspect nodes pop up in just a second. You'll see that the data is under replicated um, because we have two nodes that are down. And then if I go back to the metrics, same thing. You'll notice that you know we can still um, be able to transact on queries that are coming into the database. So this is how we do resilience. <laughs> it's um, it's very, oh, I think I'm actually running out of time on that. It's only a five minute window of, I'm running the workload, but it is a, uh, a fantastic way of building resilience into, um, you know, into the database so that you can do global scale, you can survive through multiple failures uh, and continue to serve traffic to your end users. So that's kind of the first demo that I have. I have a couple more, but maybe I'll pass it back to Jim and I'll get the other ones, the other ones set up in just yeah, a second. Hey, hey, Chris, can you once again explain what a range is and how that's different than a shard? Um, because I think like under-replicated ranges is kind of one of these things that's a little bit different for people to understand. It's like, you know, I think if I'm coming from the Postgres world, I definitely know what a shard is. Um, but how do you explain ranges? Yeah, it's a great question. So if you take an object within cockroach, right? Let's just take a table. When you load data into that table, we're going to actually automatically split up that data for you into what we call ranges. You can conceptually think of them like shards. Um, those ranges are going to be um, sized appropriately, anywhere from 64 megabytes to now 512 megabytes. And what we do is we sort the data lexicographically in each of the ranges. So it allows you to do range scans really fast across all those ranges. And within each range, you actually have a, a replica set. So each range, because we have a replication factor of three, there'll be three rec replicas within that, replicate, that replica set, and one of them is going to be the leader, or what we typically refer to as the leaseholder. And that leaseholder is going to coordinate all the reads and writes for that particular replica set. And you know, as we increase the replication factor, that replica set will go from three to five to seven to nine, whatever you need that replication factor to be. What's nice about the way we design the database in this regard is that this is our basically our internal sharding mechanism. Um, and you don't have to maintain it. The database maintains it all for you. If you had to do this with the legacy databases, you have to you know, um, have different instances with you know, making sure that your application knows which shard to connect to when it's doing a particular transaction. In the cockroach world, you're just connecting to the database. That's it. And we'll, we'll do all the... Um, distribution of the data and the replication of the data for you without having to do all that operational headache that you might be used to doing with uh, legacy databases. 
Yeah, operational headache, not just within the data, but at the application layer as well, and actually understanding where to go for data. Um, I, I think that was one of the coolest things about Cockroach, which is one of those things I think is less understood, is that you don't need to go to the node where the data lives either, right? Chris, every node or every instance all, well, there's four live nodes. Any of those four live nodes can take a query and find the data within the cluster of the four nodes, correct? Correct, right? Yeah. So I can go back to the, the distribution page, right? So right. right now I have replicas across, you know, I have five replicas across, you know, six nodes. Let's just say I can't, the request came on to node number one. Well, node number one is just the gateway to the other nodes, right? So right. it's me to where that leaseholder is so that I can go and query and do reads and writes to that particular range. So all the nodes communicate with each other um, in order to uh, serve traffic to requests. Right. So you basically get all the benefits of sharding without having to shard. Uh, and it just looks like a single instance of a database, but actually you could start to do this in multiple regions and have great performance and like all that, you get all that. Like you don't have to set up active passive anymore. You don't need these two weird instances. It's basically when something goes down another node just picks it up, right? So I think that's the, the key stuff. Yeah, and just to add on top of it, I mean, you have one backup. It's not like you have to do multiple backups from all those sharded databases that you have. You have right. one, you know, everything's contained into one system, which is really operationally sweet. <laughs> yep. Hey, there was a there was a question that came through, um, and I, I I told everybody I would answer it live. Um, you know, can cockroach? You know, do you provision cockroach on a virtual machine or a physical host? Do you use a stateful container? How do you how do you deploy a node of cockroach? Yeah, great question. So. What's nice about Cockroach, it needs no specialized hardware. It is hardware agnostic. So you can run it on a VM, you can run it in Kubernetes, you can run it on bare metal. Um, the world's kind of your oyster with what hardware you want to run Cockroach on. Right. Yep. And then, um, yeah, I could spin it up right here on this on this Mac, right? So Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, if you know Terminal, go for it, right? Like, you know, not everybody does, I guess. Not my mom. So. Um, <laughs> So Chris, and let's come back to the, how, the, how the data is sharded. Um, and I think it's actually a pretty important point. Um, what do we use to, to basically manage and deal with these things? Um, you know, this automatic sharding, right? It's, it's, it has to do with like the keys ultimately, right? Yeah, yeah. So we can, um, the, the database will automatically shard for you. It's typically based on size, right? So the amount of size that you're put, or the amount of data you're putting into a range, when that range gets too big, it'll start splitting. Uh, the same token, if there's a number of transactions that are happening on a particular range, it will even split the range as well. So we look at both size and the transactions that those range, right. ranges are incurring. Yeah, and, and the shard itself is basically, you know, it's, it's in the schema that you define for the database itself, you kind of have to define, you know, how do you want to shard? And so it's kind of one of these things where I think it's a little bit different than a normal database. It's just basically a create table or alter table and you're telling it what to do. And you could even change that in production too, correct? Absolutely. And not only that, Jim, I'll add this one on. You can be really deterministic as where you want those ranges to be. So in scenarios like where you have, you know, GDPR regulations, where you have data that cannot leave Germany per se, I can say, hey, make sure all my ranges or all my replicas are only in Germany and not anywhere else in the entire cluster. So you can right. be really specific as far as where you want to land um, your ranges and the leaseholders. Uh, so that you can, like Jim mentioned before, bring the data closer to the users or, you know, yeah. bring the data to where it needs to be um, computed upon. So yeah. by default, all, you know, Cockroach does everything for you, balances the data across the cluster. And then when you want to be a little bit more deterministic, you can pick where you want that data to actually um, reside. And live. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, there was a question about this in the chat as well, Chris. Um, you know, if I have, you know, four nodes, how, how do you typically deal with, you know, four instances of an application or maybe five different applications all hitting the same database? Um, how do they choose which node? Is it just do load balancing and that sort of thing? Yeah, so you could just use a, a single network load balancer and that will distribute the traffic round robin across all the different nodes. Um, right. And what's also great about Cockroach is that we have heuristics built into uh, our database. So as nodes have more requests that are happening for the same piece of data, we'll eventually move those ranges into those nodes. That way you don't have to incur all that network traffic. So um, 
let's just say we have a geo distributed cluster and we have a lot of folks in the in the UK that are act, trying to access a particular data set, we'll move those ranges into the UK so that they're having super low latent queries and everything that they're querying is local. Right. Yeah. And I, it's pretty cool. And it's like, look at, you can have resiliency, you can have speed or you can have correctness. And, you know, I think these are kind of one of these trade-offs and with Cockroach, you're kind of getting all of them. Um, and I think there's some interesting things that we've done to, to, to help that out. I think Chris, you know, you, you touched on one of the things I will end with, but like the whole being able to tie data to a location and have the database smart enough to do that um, is, is actually pretty, pretty cool uh, from a data privacy thing, but we do it for performance, like I was saying, right? And so I think it's a, it's a critical thing to actually understand like where data lives. And I think, you know, when I, I think one of the first things that, that I really noticed about this database that was really different is like when you define your data model, uh, when you define, you know, your tables and what it is, you, you, it's not just the, the, you know, the structure of the table itself. You kind of got to think about what you want to survive and how fast you want that data to be accessed. And, and, and this, this latency and resilience are kind of two physical aspects of data that one never thought about before or, you know, in a, in a single instance database because it wasn't distributed. And so I think that's the real paradigm shift. Um, and depending on what you want to survive is is really what you want to do with those things. So, right? Spot on. Right on. So I'm going to go back to the presentation for a second here and we'll come back to Chris. I know you guys want like, you know, get, get the, the marketing guy out of here, but where is this thing? All right. So let me go back to... All right, Chris, can you see my slides again? Yes. Okay, good. Great. So we went through a little bit of scale, a little resilience. Thank you for all the questions. We are getting a fair amount of questions. Um, there are some that are a little deeper than others that I, uh, I'll, I'll try to get to at the end, uh, but I'm trying to line them in with, with where we're talking about things as well. So if, asked, if you've asked a question, uh, I'm trying to, I think I know where we're going, so I'm trying to get in the right spot, but we'll, we'll try to hit everything at the end as well. So, you know, we were talking about this at, with Chris and, and, you know, each node being this kind of, you know, self-contained instance. And so one of the principles of, of distributed systems and, and like, if you think about something like Kubernetes, somebody asks, is this like Kubernetes gonna run? I'm like, yes, some of the so core design principles that were used for Kubernetes in that, you know, designed to be shared nothing, um, designed so that each atomic unit is the same across all your instances. We do that, right? Like designed for resilience, designed for scale, right? And, and architected and built for these sort of things. We're doing all that within within this. Um, but what's really important is that each instance, we don't have different types of nodes. Every node is the same. In fact, the UI that Chris was showing could have been serviced off of any one of the nodes. Um, you know, every node complains all it contains, you know, the, the security constructs and 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 how you integrate with everything else and the management and 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 you know, we're actually doing a cost-based optimizer within this database. It's distributed, pretty, pretty cool. Um, and this global coordination thing is the logic that keeps everything together. Um, and so each, each node is a consistent gateway. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about resilience and, and what this means, a little bit about integration. I think, you know, one of these things, um, you know, a lot of people wanna integrate, you know, Cockroach with other systems. Like when you had a question, you know, is this for, oh, well, can, I, can I use this with, with OLAP? Do I wanna run analytics? I would argue that you really don't wanna use data that's in multiple different regions to run analytics because you don't want the egress and all the traffic and all these things, right? Like, so, if you're going to do analytics, typically we do it in a single data center. This database can do some pretty cool things. We have, you know, vectorized query, which allows you to do some really kind of basic, uh, you know, analytics on tables and these sort of things. But a lot of people want to use like a very specialized OLAP database. So you use CDC, which we implement in Cockroach itself, um, change data capture to integrate with, you know, a data warehouse like a Snowflake or, or one of these other kind of systems. And, and we're going to actually show you a little bit. Of, I think we're going to show that today, right, Chris? And then, uh, and then I think another one, when it comes to resilience, resilience isn't always about uptime in the moment of failure. Um, it, you could extend resilience into uptime uh, when you have your own scheduled downtime. Like who wants to go through an upgrade of a database at three in the morning and raise your hand? Um, like, I, I don't know, we're not gonna get a whole lot of that. Like, you know, hey, take the database down in production. What are you gonna do that? Friday afternoon at three, Saturday morning at 2 a.m.? 
you know, we can actually run rolling upgrades as well, which is kind of a, one of these core principles. And I talked about how like Kubernetes was designed and the way that, that distributed systems. This is one of those components around resilience that actually becomes really, really important. You know, one of the questions that was, was, was in the chat just now, when, and while we're talking about resilience and, and this whole concept, you know, does Cockroach Labs have an operator? Um, and, you know, funny enough, our engineers are like, well, we don't need an operator. We can deploy pretty well. We don't have to have an operator to do rolling upgrades. We just do that. Like, I don't have to deal with resilience. Like, there's certain things around the way you install that an operator can be useful for us as well because we are so well aligned. We don't need it for the basic things. Like, other databases need operators for the install process. Other databases need operators for, you know, dealing with these upgrades and this sort of things. We don't. Um, there's things that can be eased by like, you know, implementing security on top of the cluster or ongoing maintenance and changes or, or dealing with scale. Like, and so, yeah, we have operator as well. And so, um, and so we do actually have an operator for Kubernetes, but I want to, again, uh, you know, stop the marketing guy. Let's get back into, uh, let, let's, let's, let's get back into Chris and let's do a little more demo here. Let me stop sharing, buddy. Show you a little bit about CDC and rolling upgrades. Sure. Which one should we do first? Uh, my vote is CDC. CDC. Okay, cool. All right. So, Cock you know, Cockroach has a great feature called uh, what we call change feeds or change data capture. So, if you're familiar with change data capture, um, anytime a particular event happens on a table, you know, an insert, an update, a delete, what we could do is we can create an event off of that. And we call this a change feed. And you can send that event to a bunch of different sinks. Um, so for one instance, you might want to send the data to Kafka or PubSub. Um, you might want to send the data to cloud storage. You might want to send the data to an HTTP endpoint. We offer these as different options that you can do in change feed. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, there's a couple different use cases. Some are more analytical in nature. You want some real-time analytics to be streamed off the tables as transactions happen. That's a pretty common use case. Uh, there's other ones where you, in more tight or stricter environments, you want to have data auditing. So any transaction that happens on a table, you want to be able to audit that particular transaction. Um, we've gotten to in some, into some more advanced um, use cases where that data ne does need to be replicated for other reasons or be replicated into other downstream systems. So there's a lot of different use cases. Um, one that Jim actually mentioned earlier uh, around triggers. Um, you can kind of think of this as an advanced trigger, right? Where an event happens on a database and we're basically triggering the event out to how you want to handle it, right? So um, again, you can send that in, those events off into a microservice to then be analyzed or logged or uh, replicated elsewhere. So it's a great feature. And I'm going to give you an example of how this works today. So uh, let me spin up the demo. Uh, local CDC. Okay, this is going to bring me up. Uh, this time I'm just going to do this in a single node cluster. Uh, and same thing, I'm going to run a quick workload. Um, do, do, do. This is called our mover workload. This is our sample database workload. So what this is going to do is it's going to create a database. Uh, you'll see here in a second, it's called the mover database. It's basically a, a quick application that has, uh, it's like Uber for you know, bikes and skateboards and scooters, that type of thing. So it, sends, it spits up this little application and, um, a, you know, a particular workload is running right now. And I created a job. Uh, I'll show you that job right here in a second. It's right here. It's called create change feed. And for this, we're, um, where we have a change feed on the rides table. So any event that's happening on the rides table, I actually have this being streamed out into an S3 bucket. And you can see that it's resolving every 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, I'm getting a dump of data that's actually spit, getting spit out into S3. Um, and again, those things can be different. I can send this to Kafka. I can send this to an HTTP endpoint. There's a couple different options available for you. So if um, we want to go see that output, I'm going to click return. And it's going to go into my S3 bucket. And you know this is all, you know, it's a command line demo, but you can see this is, these are all the changes that you know happened that were sent out into S3, right? I can see um, after the values were changed, I can see you know um, you know each one of those columns what the new values are. 
Um, and then it also provides me the primary key for that particular change. So really nifty feature. You can even output both the before and after values as something's getting changed. Um, and really quick and easy to do. It's just you create a job within the database like you see here, and then it will start outputting that data for you. Okay, pretty straightforward. Should we go over to uh, rolling upgrades next? Or Yes, you bet. Any other questions there? Okay, all right. Let's remove this cluster. And I'm going to bring up another one. So let's clear this. And we're going to do uh, an upgrade. Okay, so I'm going to spin up a new cluster. This is going to be a 5 node cluster. And we have this in... I forgot what version I put this in. Actually, let me refresh this. Okay. You're, you're probably saying, wow, this is a new UI. And that's just because this is our older, our older version of Cockroach. I believe this is, yeah, 19.25, right? The versions that I've been showing you so far have all been our 20.1 release. So what I'm going to show you here is kind of the same thing. I'm going to spun up a five node cluster. I'm going to run a workload. And then one by one, I'm going to actually upgrade the binaries for each of the nodes that you see here. And when this is done, I will have a fully functioning new 20.1 cluster all online. I don't have to do any downtime when I'm doing this particular upgrade. All right, so let me click the next step. Um, yep, I have my, my workload should be running. Let's just make, make sure. Yep, we can see we have you know, inserts, updates, deletes happening. I forgot which workload this is. Oh, this is the YCSB workload again that's happening. All right, so we can see the metrics here. All right, so I'm going to click through my, my self-driving demo. And it's going to start walking through each one of the nodes now and upgrading them. So you can see the first node, um, node number five, was just upgraded to 20.1.0. And let's just see if our metrics are still going. Yes, the metrics are still going. Uh, Cockroach is you know, letting us know too that we have mixed binaries uh, happening within the database, which is completely fine because we are doing an upgrade. And this will continue to run through each of the, you know, each of the nodes. So now I have, um, you know, three nodes that have the new binary. And then it will keep going until we're complete here. So let's see where we're at. Yep, we're doing the uh, fourth node now. So that should be popping up here in a second. Again, let's go take a look at those metrics. Yep, still looking pretty good. All right, we're on the last one. All right, and there we are. Now we're on same cluster. We're on 20.1 20, 20 that you can see here. If we go back to the metrics, we can see that the, our workload ran the entire time throughout that upgrade. Pretty cool, right? No downtime needed in order to you know do a major a major version upgrade. So it's awesome. It's pretty awesome. And, yeah. And so I mean, you could download and do this today. Anybody can download and do this today. Chris, can you talk a little bit about Cockroach demo and what we actually include in the binary? Um, because I think. What we didn't talk about today is like, yeah, Chris has a workload running underneath. Like we talked about Mover. We've talked about, you know, it's like we have a TPCC. We have, can you just go into a little bit about Cockroach Demo and what's in there so that if people wanted to try this, you could download it today. You could kind of see everything that's there. Yeah. So within the binary, uh, which what's great about a binary is just, it's just one binary. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's the, the same binary is used across all the nodes. You don't have one for particular master, another one for a worker, or one for the client. It's all one binary, it does everything for you. Um, if you go and download our software, it's pretty easy to just do, uh, as you have the binary, you know, dropped into the user local bin or what have you, you can just type cockroach demo like I just did there. In case people didn't see it, I'll show you again. All you have to do is just type cockroach demo. And this quickly spins up an in-memory um, uh, enterprise cluster, so you can have some of the enterprise features here as well. It is in memory. It's only used, I think, for about, uh, I think it's going to stay live for about an hour or so. But uh, it gives you sample data. Um, so I can do show databases. You can see the databases that are here. Um, I'm using movers, so I can do show tables. And you know the tables I was showing you before, you have them right here, um, as, you, as you see. It gives you, you know, a link to the admin UI. So I can go click on this, and that brings up the admin UI for, uh, for me to use. And 
There you go. I, I'm actually pointed to an older version right now, um, but I can easily go to a, yeah. uh, a more recent version. Let me just do that real quick. Okay. Um, oh, actually, I want to do cockroach demo. And if you do help, um, you can right. even do um, spin up an entire uh, geo partition cluster where you're actually spinning up um, nine nodes. So let me show you how to do that. Cockroach demo, geo partition replicas with load. All right. So this is actually going to spin up a nine node in memory cluster. Um, and it's going to have load. And you're going to see load happening on, it, on the particular cluster. And um, the other nice thing about it is that because it has load, you can see what's actually happening in the database. So uh, let me bring up the admin UI for this. And this goes back to what Jim was talking about on making data easy. Um, that's what we're doing, right? So right now I have a database. All I had to do is type in one command, cockroach demo, you know, geo partition rec replicas with load. And then I have a database that's off and going. Um, and if I look at what that database looks like, um, I believe I, we have a node map on this. I think we do. It gives me a virtual look of how a three node cluster, uh, excuse me, a nine node cluster would look like that's uh, geographically dispersed between US West, US East, and Europe West. Three nodes running in each of the regions so that we can optimize for resiliency and latency, correct, Chris? Absolutely. Yeah. And so in the docs as well, y'all, like the, the, you know, our docs team is a, I, they get the credit internally and they know we love them. Um, but I think the, the public actually, we get a lot of comments on our docs. Like if you're, if, I would love for y'all to go check out our docs, like try out Cockroach Demo, go into the documentation, try things out. You know, when we start to look at like the alter table command and things that we can do around geo partitioning and moving things around, um, there's some really cool stuff that y'all can play with, um, you know, beyond this, but, you know, making sure that you have something that's really easy to deal with, um, you know, and, and spin up is, is, was really critical for us so that you can actually go experience some of these things. We'd love for you to watch the webinar again as well, but you know, hey, right. So, um, just to add to that, Jim, a lot of the demos that you're seeing today are in our docs. Yeah. The, the, the first demo that I did, the resilience demo, is basically this. If you go to our tutorials and go to the fault tolerance and recovery, you can go and do this yourself. It's really simple and easy to set up. And like Jim mentioned, our documentation has been world class. Yeah. Uh, so simple, a marketing guy could do it. <laughs> so let me, let me roll this out. We had a couple more questions. Uh, I'm going to actually share my screen. Can you? Sure. Right, thanks, Chris. Where is the guy? All right. So thanks, Chris. I, I love finger on keyboards. We do have a couple more questions, so stick around. I don't think you're going anywhere. I know I got you booked at least until the top of the hour, right? So, yep. um, so one thing we didn't talk about here, and I do think it's, it's a little bit more difficult to actually show because actually underneath, and somebody was asking a question about, you know, how do queries get executed in Cockroach? Is it all kind of gone to one node and all the data goes there? No, actually, we're, we're actually doing distributed SQL execution. And so this is what I meant by like, we didn't take a legacy database and put like distributed storage underneath. No, we actually re-architected the entire SQL execution layer of the database. If you think about database, right, there's a language and there's storage because data has got to live somewhere, right? It's got to actually be written to a disk. And then between that is this, this execution layer. And that's where a lot of the magic happens. And so, you know, we're doing things in Cockroach that are unique that allow us to get, you know, like, you know, local type, latencies with, with global transactions, no matter where you're at in the planet. Um, you know, look up parallel commits and what we're doing there. Um, this is some software engineering that's just truly phenomenal uh, around what we're doing. And so how do we actually give people that type of experience where, you know, we could shrink the amount of round trips it takes to actually execute something uh, in real time. Uh, and so there's some really cool things that we've done, but we're actually guaranteeing serializable isolation um, for transactions. So this isn't like eventual or snapshot consistency or I like to call it casual consistency, which means it's, you aren't sure. Um, no, we're actually giving you kind of like the system of record type transactions uh, in, in, in a distributed database, which is not simple to do. And so 
Um, I think it's a really important kind of piece of what we do. And then as Chris noted before, being able to tie data to a location, understanding ranges and these primary keys and what we actually store data on, what that thing is. I think it, it's too deep of a topic to get too deep into. Somebody was asking, you know, how do you optimize or how do you choose a primary key for, for naming your shards? Remember when I was talking about, it comes back to how you want to survive things and what kind of latency you want to have on that data. And it's those two questions which are critical in the design of the database itself that you've got to ask up front. And it's a, it's a process we typically will go through with organizations. Dump into our public Slack channel if you have, want to have a conversation about that as well. Lots of people ask us about that. Um, but it's really, really critical to think through. The nice thing is, is if you wanted to change it, you can. Um, and you don't have to have downtime. So if you, if you have a primary key that you're sharding on, you actually want to change the way things are sharded so that, oh wait, I added a node. So you know what, I need, no, I need data that was once tied to the UK to be tied to Germany because I have different privacy laws there. I could spin up a node, I could do an alter table command and the database is gonna start moving that data to the new location, right? If I wanted to change shards at any time, it, you're just doing this all online. And so we can tie data to location, but you can do it in production as well, which I think is like one of those cool things about the database that, that's just awesome. So. We're being used by lots of different companies. Um, typically, people are using us for the kind of net new greenfield applications, you know, anywhere you would or a, a relational database, you can use Cockroach and you're going to gain the value of scale and resilience and distributed transactions. Even if you're in a single data center and you only need that, you're still gaining the value of the scale and resilience, right? Even if you aren't doing globally distributed apps. We do work very well with Kubernetes. We've got a lot of material on how well we work with Kubernetes. We are a cloud native database, the same kind of core concepts. You're going down the path of actually building out kind of applications that are being deployed in Kubernetes. Definitely look at us. You know, somebody was asking about, you know, how does this work with daemon sets and how do we do rolling upgrades? Well, the same way you would do a rolling upgrade in Kubernetes, the same way you're gonna run here. You're just gonna take nodes down, pods down, pods up. We're gonna use stateful sets typically. You could use daemon sets to, 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 to deploy Cockroach as well. Um, we typically use stateful sets. Uh, that technology in Kubernetes, if you're familiar with it, has been very beneficial. Of course, we're used for compliancy and data privacy because we could tie data locations. Um, you know, when people have global applications and latencies in mind, they use us. And then some people actually serve us up as a database, as a service internally in the organization for developers to go and play with. Um, since we are kind of cloud native and built for the cloud, it actually fits very well in these kind of, you know, as a service type environments. But, you know, ultimately when I think about Cockroach, it is for these kind of transactional workloads. Anywhere you would think about a relational database, we would love for you to try Cockroach as well. Um, you know, we've gone to great lengths to be wire compatible with Postgres so that this just appears as normal SQL to the developer. Um, but it has all these added benefits of everything that we kind of went through today. So. Last thing, you can consume this lots of different ways. Cockroach Core, uh, it's the, the, the version that Chris was running. You can download and, and, and get it. We have Cockroach DB Enterprise, which, which basically packs some, some more deeper features in here, um, enterprise features. Uh, and then there's Cockroach Cloud, which you can go and download today uh, and get started. Um, we'll give you actually a, a free 30-day cluster. Um, I think it's CRDB 30. I think the code is on there. But you know, we'll manage and deploy all the hardware. Um, we'll maintain and ensure uptime. We implement, you know, the, a secure cluster, uh, however, however you wish that to be. Um, you can also go out and learn a whole lot about Cockroach, not just via our documentation and using the product as well. Oh, we've gone to great lengths. Uh, Lauren and, and Will here in the picture, they're, they're awesome. Uh, you know, we've gone to great lengths. So there's a whole university team. Uh, Crossman, I, I gotta mention you too, right? Um, you know, and there's some hands-on coursework. A lot of people like to, to learn through that. And you can pass an exam and, and receive a certificate of completion, you know, show that off on LinkedIn and whatnot as well. So you, you can enroll and, and learn more there too as well. So with that, I wanted to thank everybody. I, you know, we only have about three minutes, Chris. Um, and I know there was a bunch of questions. I think I actually, you know what, I, I'm going to have to, we're going to have to end. Um, but, but we did try to insert a lot of the questions along the way. Um, anything else in the last stretch of stuff, Chris, that you wanted to comment on? I don't think so. I, I, uh, I've been trying to answer some of the questions in the Q&A and the yeah. ones that we can't get through today, we'll certainly uh, do that as a follow-up. But I really appreciate everyone's time here. It seems like everyone stayed on the entire time. Uh, I hope you learned something today from <laughs> our explanations and demos and do you know reach out to us if you need to learn more. And like Jim mentioned, 
our documentation is fantastic. If you go to Cockroach University, it's a great way to, you know, to start picking up the product and learning more about us. And the Slack channel. I can't, I can't, I can't advertise it more. Like I spend a fair amount of my day in, in our public Slack channel. I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of us do um, because we're, we're learning from everybody as well at the same time. And so, you know, we just really want to build, you know, and we have, we've built a database that that is kind of looking into, sometimes I think we're living three years in the future with this thing, Chris, um, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's fun, uh, but we're learning a whole lot from, from our community of users as well. And so, we really appreciate the questions and, and, and the usage and, 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 and learning more about us. And, and thank you all for joining us today. So Chris, my friend, thank you so much for everything today. That was, that was awesome. Um, and everybody else, thanks for joining. Have a great day. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.